Hey, have another clip from my favorite drummer, Simon Phillips. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Stream Music. What kit were you playing on Small Creeps Day? What, what were you playing there? Oh, that was the first recording session I did with a Tama kit. Oh. That was, it had arrived in um, around March of 79, April maybe, and that was the first time. I think we recorded in May in Stockholm, and that was the first time I used that, and it was a Tama Fiber Star drum kit. Yeah, that, that was, yeah. Otherwise, I'd been using Ludwig all, all before yeah. that. Do you, uh, uh, were you given, and I've asked the other guys that for that album, um, I'm doing a special on that album, and right. uh, were you given any special instructions from Mike before going in there? I mean, obviously he knew who you were. Did you know him before this? I knew of him. Okay. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because I have just been logging all of my uh, sessions and shows from 1969 to when I started through, well, as far as I can go. I just finished 1982 yesterday. And uh, luckily, um, my partner, when I, who I was with at the time of the fire, she went in and rescued a bunch of hard drives that were in, the, in my makeshift studio at the time. My diaries, my old diaries from... Uh, I only go, go back to 73 to 92, which is when um, I left England. There's a couple of 2000-era diaries, but um, not very well kept up. Are you writing a book? But anything for... I am. I am. And part of this is I want to log everything I've done. Was it, uh, it, and it brings back so many... And it helps me kind of formulate stuff for the book too so i just came across small creeps day so what you what you forget about are uh, you you remember the records you remember the studio maybe the engineer producer where you were at the time you don't remember trip to mike rutherford's house for a meeting <laughs> rehearsals at nomis or at easy hire you know you forget about all that stuff you don't realize how maybe how many days of rehearsal we did yeah I think we did about five days rehearsal. Um, so uh, back to your question, um, it was great. He just played. It. I think he'd made some demos, but these were in the days really before you had polished demos. Um, and a lot of it was just okay. Learn, listen to the music, and then start playing. Um, he wouldn't really be. Uh, I think he was pretty happy with the way it was going. He'd make suggestions, of course. And then before we knew it, we were in Tola with David, and David Bascom was his assistant. Um, and I remember going into the control room and hearing the most incredible drum sound, the beautiful drum sound. Um, now, <laughs> I maybe shouldn't say this, but sadly, when I heard the record, I didn't like the mixes at all. Is that right? Yeah, he didn't. What the sound we got in that control room did not transfer to the, to the uh, record which was a shame. He had these beautiful tom-tom sounds, you know, yeah. but uh, they had got missing. They just kind of got thin. Well, everyone's which, talking about a, a, a re-release of that, and I know that, was it Cherry, what's the name of that company, that, that uh, Cherry Hill? Or, they, re they re-release a lot of stuff. They're going after right. it, uh, but Mike doesn't seem interested in that project at all for whatever reason. I don't know why. It's, to me, the best thing he's ever done. It's, and by the way, Small Creeps Day, the seventh one, and Elton John's Madman are my three favorite albums of all time. So there you go. So yeah. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to talk to as much people as I can on those albums. But uh, yeah, yeah, they're trying to re they're going after that album because there's a resurgence for that album. You can't even buy it. You have to yeah. go on Amazon. Right. By the way, yeah. out into the daylight. I'm, I want to move on, but out into the daylight. That instrumental from that album. I don't know if you remember that. Um, that to me. That's a song that convinced my son tried to do it. My son was, you know, my son stopped being a, a little YouTube prodigy drummer on on YouTube because he said, I don't want to be one of the million kids who do that. Yeah. But yeah. he's a huge, he's going to come and say hi to you before I let you go. But he was over there trying to do out into the daylight. Of course, he was nine. There's a, there's a version of it on the internet. We can't use the music because, but he came up to me and he says, and he was like, remember, nine. He says, this is the hardest shit I've ever heard, I've ever played in my life. <laughs> He says, oh, my God. 
because he he was starting to be a Roger Pope fan for the Elton John, when Elton John jo oh, joined Roger Pope because Roger he likes busy he likes people who fill the gaps. He likes Nigel yeah. Olson, but he said I'm more of a Roger Pope type of drummer. And then he got into you and he says I'm I kind of like that. He says I, I I like those I like a lot of drumming. He likes that. Right. What is uh, what's the name of that track? Uh, out into the blue. Uh, no, out into the daylight. Into the. Um, that song changed my life. Okay, I got to listen to that because I, I I have no idea. Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, wow. Can you hear it there? I'll try. Yeah. Well, you see, that's a 6-8 groove, and that was one of my all-time, still is, all-time favorite groove. Um, I love uh, love writing songs, <laughs> funny enough. I just went for a walk, and all my song ideas come when I'm walking. Really? And I just got back and started a song in six. Isn't that funny? Not that kind of groove, though, but, but still, I love the, the fact that you've got two extra beats to play around with melody wise especially for instrumental you know so that was one of my favorite grooves in those days um and uh i think i know why what i didn't like about the sound the studio polar it was a pretty live i was in a big room on my own isolated it was a pretty nice live room and so when we were listening to the playbacks uh david was monitoring the ambience mics you know quite loudly and I love, if you listen to my mixes, the, the drums always have quite a bit of ambience on them. Um, usually natural. It's a mixture of natural and, and um, reverb, or whether it be plate or, or um, you know, it's, it's all virtual now, but whether it be room or plate, you know, chamber. Um, but I always, I utilize the ambience uh, uh, a lot. So I think when I hear it now, I go, oh, I know why I didn't it. It's too dry. It sounded like a 1977 sounding mix. Not a, even then I wanted more room. Isn't that funny? Wow. And I didn't really understand that much about it from a technical point of view. Uh, that kind of came in the 80s. Um, it, all I knew was I loved live rooms. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of, of intimidation, I mean, you're a different drummer than Phil Collins. And uh, at that age, but you were younger at that age, was the fact that you were playing with Phil Collins' guitar player, did that, did that bother you at all? Or at that point, had you been, had you been, you've been playing with some big guys already? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the only time intimidation came in, or maybe uh, awe, let's say, was when I was a huge fan of the person I've just been asked to play with. So I remember Greenslade. I was a huge Coliseum fan, and I loved Dave Greenslade's playing, and I was asked to do his record uh, in 1976. I was like, wow. So I had to really control my enthusiasm, as it were, curb my enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, but again, it was a professional thing. I always tried not to uh, – I just wanted to – I was – not that I wanted. I was taught to be professional. Yeah. And I think that's what came from my – both my, my parents, actually. Um, so I never let it, it, it get, get in the way. I mean, the first session I did for Pete Townsend, which was the same year, by the way, 1979. I mean, I was like, wow. But, you know, I just, you know, and found a, a, an area that we could talk about 
and he was great. He was very engaging. First time I saw Pete, came into Wessex Studios, came straight up to me and said, hi, and uh, said, I, 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 I heard of you, oh, I heard you playing on a Gordon Giltrap single, blah, 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 whatever it was. Um, and I went, oh, wow. He said, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and he mentioned something about Jeff Beck. And I said, oh, we literally just got back off tour with Jeff and Stanley Clark. So we had a, a thing to talk about, you know, and he was immediately – um, had huge um, admiration for for uh, huge love for Jeff, you know. So and that's how we started. That's and, a good way uh, to stay cool too. That's the thing. I mean, people forget that musicians will meet other. Mu the fans sometimes forget that a musician will meet another musician, and they'll feel like if they met you or if they met somebody else, they forget that musicians feel the same way when they meet other artists. That yeah. they, I don't know why so many fans forget that, but of course you're human like anybody else. A little. Backstory to to Mike Rutherford, by the way. You asked about Phil. Um, in 1976, I was at the Manor Studios, which is Richard Branson's Virgin Studio, uh, recording the uh, Jack Bruce album, House Tricks. I got a call from Phil Collins asking me to join Genesis. This was in 1976. So they had just finished the tour with Bill Bruford, or that, that period, and he was looking for another drummer. And I said, now, I hate to say this, Genesis were not high on my list of favorite bands. I was a little bit more uh, jazz than that, you know? And so I wasn't so familiar with Genesis music until later. Then I became actually a huge fan of Genesis, you know, and a huge fan of Phil. I mean, what a songwriter, stunning, and a singer and Peter Gabriel too. But I was a little late to the party there. But I had to say to him, well, unfortunately, Phil, I'm, I've am i just joined Jack Bruce and we put a band together and I'm actually signed as a as a band member to the record company. So it's not, it wasn't just a session, we were on, on points. Never got a royalty statement, but there you go. Um, and uh, we, we kind of booked to do this record and do a whole bunch of touring through 77, um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to decline. And so he said, oh, okay, I, I, I understand. He said, well, look, perhaps if you're not too busy, could you fill in for me for Brand X while I'm rehearsing with Genesis? And I said, sure, because I knew Robin Lumley from uh, Brand X. I, I knew Morris Perth too. So uh, I went, oh, absolutely, would you know, be honored to. That would be lovely. And then that's when he went, hmm, I'm going to give Chester Thompson a ring. Let's get Chester's number. And that's how Chester became in the band. Really? Wow. And we were missing next door at the place called The Farmyard, owned by Trevor Murray. Genesis were in the big room. Brand X was in the small room. And I used a Ludwig Octoplus drum kit. And next door was Chester's Octoplus drum kit, which is the reason I got mine. So I was a huge fan of him. And then Phil's kit. So I, I would go in there and, you know, meet everybody, say hello, and just, just hang for a little bit. It was, it was actually really fun. It was great. And that's probably when I first met uh, Mike, too. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.